So today we're going to talk about facet cysts, something that um, you could see either quite often or quite rarely. And this is one of these things that you might see three of them in one week and then never see one for the next three months. And they're very variable. So they could be either small in size, large in size, they could cause radicular symptoms or just axial symptoms. And we'll get into some of the um, specifics in a moment. So here are my disclosures. Um, as mentioned, I do uh, quite a bit of work in the medical industry. And what are facet cysts? So there are several different names, as you can see listed here. Um, we typically just call them facet cysts or spinal synovial cysts. And they are really cystic formations that have some form of connection to the actual facet joint themselves. And just like the facet joints, they are with synovium and synovial fluid. So these uh, facet cysts have actual synovial fluid in them, creating that mass effect. Um, I'll be honest with you, I forget all the pathology and all the little cells and things in here, but I thought it was a cool picture to demonstrate how you have fluid um, on one side and then um, a thickening of that fluid to become the outer layer on the other side here. So they mainly occur in the lumbar spine. I have rarely seen them in the cervical and thoracic spines, although I could probably count the number of time on one hand where I've seen them, but um, it's definitely more of a consistent finding in the lumbar spine. Um, typically, you're going to see them at the L4-5 level, which um, to make the parallel, you are going to see spondylolisthesis and disc herniations and other sorts of spinal instability also primarily at the L4-5 level. So we'll see how much of a um, connection there is between arthritis and degeneration of the spine and these cysts. So as you can see that there's 60 to 89% occur at this level and a relatively equal percentage occur at the L5-S1 level and the L3-4 level. So they usually form from the ventral and medial portion of the capsule. And we'll see in subsequent slides that um, it typically will be within the spinal canal region when these occur. And of course that could produce neurologic or radicular type symptoms. So they could invade the spinal canal and form this sort of compression. So how does this occur? This occurs mainly through this arthritic or degenerative process. So like anything else, repetitive motion and age-related changes create this chronic inflammatory state. And due to this micro instability, you have the joint capsule that's breached by the synovium. And with that, there's this fluid that is then essentially created, forming this enlarged facet. And there's the proliferation of fibroblasts that increase this hyaluronic acid production, right? So then it becomes an actual cystic structure. And there is that associated degenerative spondylolisthesis, very much um, caused by the things that I just mentioned, where there is this instability that occurs. And then of course, um, you know, in a mi minority of patients, it can be due to traumatic causes such as fractures or sprains. So here is a very good example of the cyst. You can see the arrow on the picture on the right pointing to it. So you could see a relatively hypo intense rim on the outside with a, as you go deeper into the layers, then you see a hyper intense um, inner rim, which is really the fluid. And then you see this central um, dark or hypo intense portion, which um, most likely is hemorrhagic. So the actual um, contents of the cyst 
in most cases are are fluid based. So you're going to see some sort of um, hyper intensity on T2 weighted imaging and typically hypo um, intense uh, characteristics on T1 imaging. Since your T1 imaging is, I'm sure you are all aware, is um, mainly going to be hyper intense for fat, whereas for T2, it's going to be mainly hyper intense for edema or fluid. So here, what we're seeing is a hypertrophic capsule as uh, indicated by the black or dark on the outside. Um, and then typically solid things are going to show up with low signal intensity, whereas the liquid things are going to show up as a um, hypo intensity on T1. And if you see some sort of gas within the cyst, um, it can be pathognomonic for the uh, for a synovial cyst here. Um, and you can see here at the bottom that there are different compositions of the cyst. It doesn't just have to be um, straight up synovium. You have uh, ligamentum flavum cyst, you have serous contents, mucoid contents, hem hemorrhagic contents. There are several different things depending on uh, the exact location of the cysts. So alluded to this before, but typically within the history, just like anything else really for lower back pain, you're going to have either straight up axial back pain without a radicular component, or you might have that type of back pain with a radicular component, or you may have no back pain, but have a radicular component. Those are typically the three things that we see. Um, neurogenic claudication. So at least in America, we see this, what we call a shopping cart syndrome. So if patients are grocery shopping or going to the supermarket, they have to bend over, they're hunching over to create more space within that canal, which is taking pressure off of the nerve root. So we see a very similar um, thing with this. And it's also suggested with a rapid onset or sudden deterioration that there could be a hematoma formed within the facet just due to the blood filling up within that facet joint, um, creating a cyst rather quickly. Um, on physical examination, as you guys are very familiar, you're going to see some nerve root deficits potentially at an associated spinal level and tenderness overlying the affected segments. So imaging, we talked about a little bit before, how we mentioned that typically for T1 weighted imaging, you're going to see the fat be hyper intense, whereas on T2 imaging, you're going to see the fluid be hyper intense. So typically, if there's any suspicion of a facet joint cyst, or really anything neurologic based on the history and physical examination. I think everybody you know, in this room is going to want to obtain an MRI to really visualize what's going on. So um, as mentioned again, the best sequence is typically the T2 axial and sagittal images where you could see a hyper intense center and a hypo intense rim. And on T1, if you need to look at uh, a different sequencing, then you're going to see that the center is hypo intense. Um, and I know I'm speaking to a room full of neurosurgeons, so this is very elementary, but just for um, for complete completeness, I'm mentioning it a few times. So for a positional MRI, we see that there is a very high sensitivity um, for both supine and standing positions, but we do see that the cysts actually enlarge in the standing position. And this makes sense, right? Because of the effect of gravity, it's basically pushing down on the facet joint, which is then kind of, I don't know another way of saying it, but kind of outpouching or splurging more fluid into that synovial cyst. So kind of just like if you have a water balloon, you squeeze one end of it, the other end is going to become bigger and inflate. That's essentially what's happening here. So for high signal intensity on T2 weighted imaging, you're going to see the synovial content. And again, with low signal intensity on the T2 and uh, T1 weighted imaging, you're going to see more of a gelatinous calcified um, solid type content. So for 
non-operative treatment, that's typically where, you know, physician like myself, interventional pain management or physical medicine rehabilitation will, um, will treat. So we're doing all sorts of conservative measures before we are injecting or doing surgery. So we're looking to have the patient rest, do some physical therapy, um, some sort of immobilization, whether that's um, self-induced or through durable medical equipment, such as a brace um, and medications such as NSAIDs or gabapentin or something that could help with, with the nerves. Um, and then we're looking at that point to perform injection-based treatments, such as epidural steroid injections. So if there is any sort of radiating component to this, um, like a lumbar radiculopathy, then we're looking to do an epidural steroid injection to see if we can get rid of that radiating component. But very often, if the facet joint is large enough, the cyst is large enough, excuse me, then that might not do much long-term, in which case we would then attempt to rupture the joint by placing a needle into the facet joint and basically rupturing that cyst through the joint. Um, this works very often. Um, however, it could be where if the thickness of that joint is too much, then a 22 gauge, three and a half or five inch spinal needle will not create enough pressure in order to actually rupture that joint. So then we're looking more towards doing operative measures, unfortunately. And about half of patients will eventually move on to surgical intervention, which is a pretty high number. So then there was a paper that I was lucky to um, be involved with that has to do with utilizing targeted radiofrequency ablation in order to create um, a reduction of the size of that cyst. Should and I, should I change the slide? Yeah. Yes, please. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention. So then you can see there was a paper done about um, seven years ago that I had the, the ability to be part of. And as you can see through some of the pictures here, we're able to get needles not only into the facet joint itself, but with a different trajectory into the location of the facet cyst as well. And we were able to utilize radiofrequency ablation to essentially um, reduce the size and cauterize the, um, the joint capsule itself. And this did result in uh, decreased recurrence of the cyst and symptomatic relief. So this is definitely um, a technique that is on the minimally invasive um, scale here prior to a bigger surgical intervention. And um, if you can, please change to the next slide. So then in terms of operative treatment, this is something where probably everybody, you know, in, in this room knows more than I do about it. But if you're having unilateral symptoms, typically a decompressive laminectomy and cyst excision is being performed first. And it's really indicated for patients, you know, with the spondylolisthesis. And there is unfortunately a high rate of recurrence with the cyst formation and back pain within two years. Um, there is a high success rate in pain reduction. However, these cysts can recur, um, especially if they are adherent to the dura because you don't want to create a dural tear. So often part of the cyst is left if it is adherent to the dura very, you know, very in a thick manner. So unfortunately, um, the procedure can also cause a spondylolisthesis with some sort of instability. Um, this is one of the reasons also why typically this procedure is not performed if you're going in bilaterally or if there's bilateral symptoms, because then that's a higher chance of instability of the spine at that segment. Next slide, please. So, with the next level here, then if you're looking at bilateral symptoms or in the cases where the laminectomy doesn't work well, 
then you're looking at performing a facetectomy and an instrumented fusion. And after conservative measures, often surgeons choose to just go ahead and implore, you know, this approach. Now, instability could occur, and that's the main reason why you actually want to place um, instrumentation within the spine as well. Um, there is a lower rate of recurrence of the cyst, um, cyst formation and back pain. And fortunately, 80 to 90% of patients will have complete resolution of their symptoms with this approach. Next slide, please. So again, you guys know this way more than me, but just for completeness sake, there's with the decompressive laminectomy and cyst excision, we're looking at utilizing a high-speed burr in order to create that laminotomy and facetectomy. And then you have a greater space in which you could excise that cyst. And it's very important to make a clear and relatively non-traumatic plane between the dura and the cyst to decrease um, you know, the chances of rupture of the um, of, of any of the ligaments that are, excuse, let me let me say again, at, between having a, a tear essentially, you know, to rupture that dura. Um, and of course, instrumentation, you want to use um, some form of traction, although without high pressure in order to create that. And then in terms of the facetectomy and instrumented fusion, you want to do everything that was mentioned above in the decompressive laminectomy, but then you're looking to place pedicle screws. And you know, typically the landmarks there are the junction of the transverse process and the midline of the superior articular process, right where that medial branch of the uh, dorsal ramus comes in. Next slide, please. And you can see here with an operative technique that you're coming in interlaminarly, but from the contralateral side. So it's an approach where it's crossing the midline and it's creating a decent angle at which to essentially um, dissect the fecal sac from the um, cyst itself and really then being able to expose that facet joint thereafter. Next slide, please. And then here you see just the construct on one side just for the picture, but really, um, it would be performed on both sides, but you can see that the facectectomies were done and then there was posterior instrumentation placed. And then if you go to the next slide, you can see various references that were used in this presentation. And if you go to the next slide, that is my contact information, which I included my email, um, my website and various social media platforms. So for me, that concludes, you know, the lecture portion of this. But um, if this is something where you normally field any sort of uh, questions or comments from the attendees, um, I'd be more than happy to, to discuss that as well.